It's wonderful to have so many people here in person. It's really fabulous. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Vogelman. Um, I'm the Assistant Curator of Fine Art here at the New Jersey State Museum, as well as the curator of this show, which is the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence. Um, and we're really lucky to be joined here today by two artists who are featured in the exhibition, George Taylor and Michelle Black. Um, and yeah, so this is part of a lunchtime series. We do one each month. We had a little brief hiatus during November and December holidays, but this is our first one in 2023. So thank you so much for being here um, in person and on the internet. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, this is sort of a series of lunchtime talks, which really gives our visitors a unique opportunity to to hear from the artists and hear more about the context of specific works and these artist practices. So, you know, it's really wonderful you're all here. Um, and before we start, I want to mention that the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence is part of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the New Jersey State Museum. It was a project of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the New Jersey State Museum. Funding for the New Jersey Arts Annual has been made possible in part by funds from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and has received additional support from the New Jersey State Museum Foundation through the Lucille M. Paris Fund. Um, so I have to do those thank yous. So thank you to them for the wonderful support for this program and for this exhibition. Um, so now I'll offer brief introductions for both of these artists, um, and I'll refrain from speaking too much about their, their work, um, you know, and they can introduce themselves much better than I can, I'm sure, and, and you'll hear from them soon. But uh, Michelle Black is an artist who works in both painting and drawing. Originally from Jamaica, Michelle arrived in the United States as a young teenager and began to pursue art with the support of his family. Um, and eventually earned his MFA at Rutgers University's Mason Gross School of the Arts. Um, Michelle's work in artistic practice reveal a common theme of isolation and explore the space between belonging and not belonging. Through his work, Michelle seeks to create a spiritual connection and community with viewers. He has exhibited throughout the state and beyond, most recently at Aquaba Gallery uh, in Aquaba. Newark. Aquaba, is that, that's how you say it? I've only seen it written down, I think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the New York Museum of Art, uh, Therese A. Maloney Art Gallery in Morristown, and Pro Arts Gallery in Jersey City. George Taylor is an artist based in central New Jersey, whose most recent work combines his interest and expertise in ceramics and self-portraiture. Uh, though throughout his career, he has also explored painting, drawing, and performance. He too holds an MFA from Rutgers University's Mason Gross School of the Arts and currently teaches painting and alternative art at Fairleigh Dickinson University and ceramics at the art school at Old Church in Demarest. In addition to this exhibition, George's work has been exhibited widely, including recent shows at the Trenton City Museum in Ellerslie, Gallery of Pharaoh in Newark, and the art school at Old Church at the Belsky Museum. Later this year, his work will be featured in Reflections, a two-person show with Marie Roberts at Fairleigh Dickinson University, as well as the 2023 Arts Annual, Mother Nature versus Human Nature at the Noise Museum. So please welcome me, I mean, don't welcome me, join me. <laughs> <laughs> please join me in welcoming these two artists uh, to our galleries. Show. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this has been awesome. So I haven't seen this painting in wow, a long time. Actually, it looks like a good painting. <laughs> no, it looks better after time. But, but um, one of the one of the questions I think. Is, Sarah had prompted with is um, where do you paint or you know, how do you name these paintings and it was particularly relevant to this painting. I mean, I, yeah, I think I'm out of the way now. But I saw, uh, I use oil paints and they're sort of toxic when you're applying it. When you have it in your home, it's perfectly fine after it's dry. <laughs> but 
so I have pain in the back in my backyard a lot, and so I get my neighbors that pop by every once in a while, and and, and they're all critics. So I get like these popping studio visits slash critiques, mm -hmm. yeah. and sometimes it's like, oh, I love that, that's amazing, and then other times it'll be like. What's that? You, you mean people pay for that? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on this one in particular, I was in the middle of it, and one of my neighbors popped by and said, Oh, that's a beautiful painting. It's a father and a son. And I said, Yeah, that is, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm, but I'm still looking for the sun. I'm like, <laughs> like, I see the father, but I can't find the sun. <laughs> so, so my, my practice, I, I do a lot of portraits of, um, it, it's sort of in my wheelhouse in the sense that I do a lot of portraits of families. So a lot of my paintings are usually mother and a child, which it's, 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 it could be my wife and my son. But it's also me and my mother, and a lot, a lot of my paintings are about that story. Simply because uh, I sort of grew up in Jamaica, not seeing my, not, not seeing my mother for the first, like, say, 13, 14 years of my life, and that, that's something I thought about and missed a lot. And then I came to live with her and my stepdad when I was 14, and but I think, I think sort of bouncing around from aunties to grandparents' house a lot to like then coming into like a stable family situation and seeing what it's like to have lunch, dinner, go to school, be picked up, dropped off in a house that's like, I know I'm not going anywhere the next day. That's a completely different experience. And so that tends to, that, that sort of experience makes its way into my pains. And it also makes its way into my own lifestyle because I think when I got out of grad school, one of the first things I wanted was I knew that I wanted I wanted to be married and I wanted a house and I wanted a kid and I wanted to like I want both of us to go to like PTA meetings. Like that's what I want. <laughs> yeah. And and but but this painting in particular though, you know, um, even though my neighbor called it husband father and son. It's, 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 it's also, it's, it's a, I've been doing these portraits of sort of like say, what I thought my ancestors would look like eight, ten generations ago. And that's, that's, uh, it's, that's in a conscious effort to sort of say, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make um, portraits not so much based on what our heroes look like in the past hundred years or what people think someone black should be making portraits of. But I'm trying to make portraits as though I lived a long time ago and I'm like the sense like like we my blackness is like the center of my universe in that time and I'm just looking at it and talking about it. And so so these these paintings are sort of like a conscious effort not to always refer refer to whiteness or refer to the dominant culture or refer to like slavery or refer to Martin Luther King Malcolm X sort of thing. So I sort of skip that whole sort of like last hundred hundred years or so in America and I go back beyond that where I can imagine me looking directly at my ancestors say before colonialism and like talking to them and and, and making portraits of them without sort of like that, you know, the last couple hundred years of like whatever, you know, so, so what happened. And um, part of it, it all sort of works together because I think going back that far also helps me to avoid using photographic references. Because uh, before, before these, before the last three, four years, I used to paint almost exclusively from photographs. I used to take pictures and draw people and then restrict myself to what I saw in that rectangle. And, you know, after, after 20 years of drawing models on a pedestal and drawing from photographs, I have enough muscle memory to understand how 
backgrounds work and how, you know, figure ground relationships, how uh, a light color work against a darker color, and then bringing in fresh marks like these lines and restrictive color palettes and sort of like how, what happens when you fade one thing into like a landscape. So the, 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 the muscle memory of sort of like this, the, this old sort of traditional European oil painting, it's still there. But I, made a, but I made a conscious effort that to, to allow more spontaneity into my work by abandoning photograph and just work, always working from memory nowadays. Because what, what I'm really interested in is, is not necessarily making a picture, but I'm interested in how the paint works. Because, you know, like these little, these little drips are important. This line is important. And this, this right here is a wash versus how thick this paint, paint is. So it's, it's, these, it's these relationships in paint that sort of fascinates me. And, and yes, I have all these subconscious, psychological, emotional things that eventually seep their way in, but as every artist knows, once you pick up some clay or you get that brush or concrete in your hands, <laughs> it, 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 it all sorts of, you, you don't sort of think about I don't think, I think artists, we get so involved in our work that sort of get lost in it. And you let all the um, political, social things, they, they sort of become background issues. You're really concerned about, I'm really concerned about, you know, like this slush, slush of paint that comes down here. And then, and then this one little orange mark in the middle of the painting for absolutely no reason. But <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, what's the point? Like, why? But I, I think I, I placed it there in like this frenzy. And then I walked back and saw it. And I think I had enough, it, I sort of had enough discipline to realize that, yes, maybe it sort of doesn't make sense. But you have to leave it because it's, it's part of the moment. It's part of like letting chance happen. It's also realizing that I can't control everything or I shouldn't control everything. Because the, the, the minute, I think in a painting, the minute you try to control everything or rehearse it, then it sort of becomes stagnant and predictable. And the last thing I want is for my paintings to be stagnant and predictable. I want them to look sort of intentional, but a little bit silly, whimsical, sort of like they just sort of happen, almost accidental. But, uh, but obviously, I think I, I can't get away from my, you know, as many of you here, I think there's about six people here with masters in fine arts from Mason Bros. <laughs> 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 so you, you can't get away from, your, from the training. It's just there. Yeah. No matter how, you know, you try to, I think as artists, we try to turn ourselves into these five-year-olds sometimes, but you know, we're not going to run across a highway blindfolded. It's not going to happen. <laughs> we're always conscious of where we are and how, what we're doing inside of our environment. I feel like I'm just going on. <laughs> no, you should. This is your time. But you, are you saying that you're not uh, consciously looking at, you know, you're thinking about painting your ancestors, for example, from hundreds of years ago, but you're not consciously looking at maybe other paintings or portraits from that time, although you've seen it. Yeah. But, but, you, but you're not consciously looking at them to like make, to base anything off of that. No, I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not looking yeah. at any, I mean, I mean, I, to say that, I'd be dishonest, because yeah, I look at all the pictures from the African tribes, and I look at the mask. Yeah. I, even, I, I even have about five or six masks around my house that scare the kids. <laughs> 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 because these, ma these masks are like, you know, they have horns, mm -hmm. and, you know, three eyeballs, they look like Picasso. Uh -huh. Well, no. Picasso looks like yeah, that. Right. Picasso looks like them. And because we're used to seeing this sort of like, you know, like, you know, halo guy with you know, pale skin, seeing somebody with horns and like three eyes, like, oh my god. <laughs> but so I look at all of that. But when I'm making the painting, I'm not referencing it one to one. I'm not right. it, it's not it, so uh, what I'm more looking for is I'm I'm looking for the ancestors to 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 to, to like you know like come down to me and put this the spiritual spiritual connection where I'm in the in, in, in the zone sort of to say and they um, 
and I close my eyes and they tell me what to do. <laughs> and so, and, and then, so with, when I'm getting this, um, you know, the seance or spiritual revival or whatever, then that's where the sort of like um, artistic training and mastery, that, 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 that gets translated to, through my knowledge. Right. So, so it's, so it's very, it's very two set, very, one is very, you know, like, um, one is soul spiritual and one is very analytic. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this analytic get translated by, the uh, spiritual gets translated by analytic and that, that's sort of what comes out. Yeah. I'd like to say I'm totally free when I make these things, but like I said, you can't get away from that knowledge that's embedded. <laughs> yeah, no, it's your training will kick in or yeah, you're yeah. The, yeah, you already have knowledge that you've accrued over, over study and years of just being that will kick in. Um, it's really wonderful. Do you ever do studies before you paint or it, it's just, it's in the moment that you not know what you're going to do beforehand? I mean, I have, um, I have, I have, uh, I'd say I've done thousands of drawings. Yeah. I have about six, seven hundred drawings at my house, charcoal and pencil drawings. But I've, I've, st I stopped doing them a couple of years ago, because I realized it's kind of like it's kind of like boiling chicken before you fry it. You know, it's like all the solid good stuff get left in there. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine having a steak and you boil it and then you put it on the grill. Yeah. It's like you want it all, I, I want it all here. I want yeah. the drawing, I want the mistakes, I want the, uh, <laughs> the corrections, I want it all here. I don't want, because I think, I think something happened, I realized in my sketches I was, I was extremely excited about the idea. I was sketching it out, I had to get it on the paper, I wanted it to look this way and I just had to get it done in the most efficient way because I need this idea out. But when I got to the painting, I was just like, hmm, I already did it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you ever draw in a not preparatory way? Or just as a separate sort of medium? Or you're kind of just very focused on? Yes. Now I am. Now I am. Now I'm sort of going back around to just drawing. Yeah. But, but I think, but like you said, non preparatory. Preparatory. Yeah, what yeah. you said. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think drawing needs to get its respect because yeah. it's just like it's the most immediate. I think it's it's so it's the most immediate, honest form of making art. And so now, in an effort to, to sort of like um, like I'll, I'll do charcoal drawings, but I don't want to seal them because I think it changes it once you put yeah. that sealant on it. But so, but. But yes, to your story. When I do drawings nowadays, they're a finished product. They're done. They're there on work. They, I don't want any, they're not referencing anything. They're not trying to become something else. Mm -hmm. They're their own entity. Um, they're a little bit harder to display because then you got to go and frame them or transport them somehow. Yeah. But I, but I, I, that's another story. But yes, I, th I think I will. I think I will get around to doing drawings again. It's just that I had to get away from. Photographic references and or doing stuff to become something else. I just wanted that clean cut, and I, I think three years out, I, I can just make individual pieces. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, I mean, I, are you? We can open up the questions from from any of you as well. I can also keep asking questions, but who's got a question? This is a you know this is an informal. You know, talk, this is our chance to talk to the artist, which is really great. Well, I just wanted to say what I see in the painting, and I don't know what you see, but I see this kind of funny image of this dog turning his head with long eyelashes, and he has a backless dress on, and his paw like this with a big hat. Backless dress. <laughs> yeah, with, with the straps on the back, and it's quite fun. It's like. A dog sort of prancing around. <laughs> Sounds like a very erotic dog. You see this? <laughs> 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 you see? Uh, yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. The dog is yellow. The dog's nose is on the right. And he has this beautiful big hat with fruit in it. I, I see the hat with the fruit. I see the hat with the fruit. Yeah. Yeah, this is, people are, in the galleries are very drawn to, to this work, and I think it has so much to do with the texture of your paint, how you apply it, 
And I guess that, I'm wondering where that comes from for you. Where are you, because so, there are areas, if, if, you know, when you have a chance, everyone should go up yeah, you know, closely. They're a very thick um, areas of their, like, thick application. Um, or just very textural on the surface, I would say. And you really dig into the surface as well. Uh, I'm going to say that um, I just like, just like to get in there and get, I just like lots of substance. Yeah. And, and, and also, I, I say, in my journey to support my art for a long time, I was sort of like a, like a house painter. I had a house painting company, and I'm just used to scraping off lots of gob off people's houses and oil priming it, and it's just a big dirty mess. And plus, you know, I, in my former life, I was a scenic painter, so I used to paint sets for theaters. Oh, wow. And I'm just used to big stuff with lots of materials drooping and dropping. So I, I'm used. I'm just used to this sort of like. Lots of material. I've never been sort of like this clean, precious. sort of like precious, dainty. Yeah, I, did, I think I did architecture for like one semester and I was like, nope! Nope! <laughs> nope. <laughs> now, how long does it usually take you to finish a painting? That's, it, a, that's a secret. Okay. We won't reveal the secret. My whole life. We won't reveal the secret. It's still not finished. <laughs> still not finished. It's not finished until it's paid for in somebody's <laughs> house that is finished. I might still change it. <laughs> but it's interesting, in your studio, because I remember walking through your studio once, and you have some very big canvases yes. in there. And it, it, does that come from your background of doing sort of set work, sort of with like bigger or? I yeah, I mean, I'm used, to, I'm used to working in, I'm used to working on, in, in that sort of proportion. Yeah. And obviously, it's. Uh, I think every artist just wants to do the biggest, baddest thing they can do. <laughs> and luckily, I, you know, I had a studio to do that. And and plus, I think with my um, with my paintings, I like to use my entire body. And 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 you know, it's like I need more space. This is. You know, I, I so I like to be able to walk across the work and not not necessarily see what I'm doing until I step back and then I can sort of be surprised. Yeah. Because I like being an artist, but I also like to be the audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm the artist. I'm the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I, like I said, I, and I, I, have a, I have a 16, a 12 by 16 foot mural in my backyard that I paint on. And then a few months later, I erase it and then make another painting. Mm -hmm. And I'll, often I'll use like um, nine inch house painting brush, nine inch or 12 inch rollers to make that. Yeah. So uh, I think I just, I think I just, I, I, like, I, like, that, I like that size. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I work on people's houses and the side of the house is like, you know, 30 feet by 50 feet. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, just, I'm just used to working in that, in that, in that, in those dimensions. So that's sort of my, where I feel comfortable. Yeah. Yes. What's your uh, process for painting? Like, do you work every day or um, in the morning? Or, I'm just curious about your, your activity. Well, um, usually, once I can convince myself to make just like a, to paint for five minutes and I get there, and once I pick up the brush, that usually turns to about five, six hours. But, hmm. but, <laughs> But I work in spurts, so now I feel, at the beginning of the year, I was just kind of like, eh. And now, uh, now I sold a couple paintings, and I'm like, yeah, I'm an artist. <laughs> so, so now, but I, I will, I, when I do start working, I'll make eight, nine, ten paintings, and then I probably won't work for another month. I'll just take some time to process that. But also, it's just life, you know? It's like, I'll work for, like, it's a winter now, so I'll be painting for the next two, three months. But when summer gets around, I'm a little broke. <laughs> and so I gotta sort of like find some sort of job, and then I make some money, and then I'm like, I'm an artist again. I don't need your job. I'm an artist. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, I'd say, I'd say around. 
you know, four or five o'clock is when I'm inspired. And I try to finish before it gets too dark. And if I'm not finished, I'll put some big lights in the backyard or something. So, um, so I, I try to do... This one was probably done in about a four or five hour stint. And if I, usually if I come back the next day and I'm not as excited about it as I was the first day, I'll just scrape it all off and make something else on it. And uh, just like the paint that I made yesterday, I was, I started, I started around three o'clock and by six, seven, I thought it was great and I took a light and I look at it and I thought, wow, that's your best painting ever. And just before I came down here, I looked at it and I said, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to resurface that one. <laughs> so uh, I think, yeah, I can't tell whether my paintings are good or not until like about a week later. Like this one, I thought it was an okay painting and I came back and I was like, ooh, it's not bad. <laughs> so, but I, I can never tell until later. What are you trying to achieve with your paintings? I read in your write-up you want to make joy, or you know, you want to live a very joyful, isn't that, ha or happiness, like a speech? Trying to achieve with my paintings? Yeah, what I are you trying to convey to people? Like, this is, seems joyful. I'd like to celebrate the human spirit. I, I think uh, with my paintings, um, I'm not necessarily trying to, uh, is this no? terrible to say? I'm not trying to achieve anything. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think, I, I think, I think life is such a beautiful thing, and we, we are these creatures that make all these amazing things. And I just want to throw my hat in the ring, like, look what else a human being can do. And, and, and obviously, I think there are other there, there are there are other things that come along with that because I am a black man painting black brown. I'm a brown man painting brown images, <laughs> and so it sort of just. It just gets, history just wants to catalog everything. And so over time, someone 40, 50 years from now, someone will say, that, that's, what a, that's what a black guy was painted in 2020, and, they'll, and, and he, was, he, he did this, and he was joyous. And, but but mostly, mostly, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm painting, mostly for painting's sake. I mean I, I mean, I love when other artists look at my paintings and sort of understand it. I love, I love these conversations, like these human interactions, like you make this thing and it becomes a point of conversation where we also can sort of like gather and have this interaction. And that, that's really the point of it. It's, it's like how can we, this, something like this helps us to re, all to relate to each other. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, obviously 99% of what I make is going to be about blackness and black man and that just happened our maleness that just happened that's just because of who I am and and, and that's fine I mean I, I I consume plenty of white stuff I mean I watch I've watched every episode of Seinfeld Battlestar Galactica <laughs> I've watched I've watched I've watched every product out I consume everything out there that, that everyone else produced and this is just what I produce so why not why shouldn't everyone consume it the same way I can like there are, there's tons of other art in here, right? And I'll just enjoy it. That's what they that's what they mean. And I'll enjoy it, and this is what I make, and you enjoy it. And it's just something another human being made, and we can share it and discuss it. It's just a, just a platform for discussion, mm -hmm. a way we can relate to each other. Nice. Yeah. I like this idea you brought up, the concept of being an audience of your mm -hmm. own work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I really, I really like that. I mean, I think rarely um, it's articulated, um, but like the whole concept of creating. I know with me, I have intention when I create, but then I still like let it go and do what it needs to do. So then when I see it, I'm like, oh, like you said, like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and so I, I like this theme that you brought up, how we're like an audience we're an audience for our own kind of soul consciousness, you know? So I don't know if that's our ego standing outside of our consciousness, but we're like, oh, this is what our con this is what my consciousness did. <laughs> really Thank you, Noah. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. But I like that. I'll be thinking about that for a while. Look, what I did while I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs>
being being the maker and being outside of your inner dialogue and all that, just for the process of making, and I totally relate to that. And then what was interesting was how you were talking about stepping away and uh, creating separation so that you became audience for a moment. And that's also extremely interesting to me because I often, first of all, approach the studio with the thought, I don't know if I'm going to make a painting today. And, and that can be a really big stall, you know, emotionally. And you just have to get over it, you know, and, and just throw it down the canvas and just see what the heck happens uh, and, and let it lead. Uh, but, but what I've noticed, at least in my practice, and so I'm asking you, is who be, what becomes or who becomes uh, the biggest antagonist in your studio. Like for me, sometimes I'm painting and I don't know what to do, you know, except put it away for a while and see if I can become a friend, <laughs> you know. Or, or is it you sometimes? Like I feel if I show up thinking I don't have to make painting in a way, I'm my own antagonist in the studio. I wonder what, what kind of, uh, what's your thing of hurdle in the studio to cover, overcome the dynamics between you and your work? Okay, I think I got the question. Who's the bad guy in my studio? <laughs> or the bad person? Or the, 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 who's the antagonist in my studio? Well, th there's a few things, and it's, it's, it's hard to get past. For, the first one is, whenever I make a good painting, or a really good painting, that's tough, because you got to beat it, and, it, and then you try to make some sort of like cheap version of it, and it's hard. <laughs> And, and then there is um, then there is when you when I sell a lot of work, then it's like oh those colors sell, those shapes sell, but then then, then that's that, and, and, and then that, that's a problem too. And then there is there's a horrible one where it's like those um those likes on Instagram. <laughs> I gotta get more likes for the next one. But so it's hard to turn all that off, and I find that um, the only way I can get past that is. I make four, five, six, seven, eight really bad paintings while thinking they're all good. And then once I make one that's finally decent, then I like paint over all those and pretend like I never did them. <laughs> but I think everything is a problem because it's like anytime you go into a painting with expectations or having someone or something loom over your shoulder, like, like, like commissions are really hard for me. Because I'm always like having that, like, oh, I finished this, I get 10 grand. I finish this, I get 10 grand. And it's like, <laughs> so, so I think, I think just anything you bring into your studio with, anything you bring into your studio, any kind of baggage you bring into your studio with you, any kind of baggage is a problem. And so um, sometimes it's, sometimes I'm just so excited that I just bypass all that. And sometimes I just got to make a really, a lot of really bad work to get past it. <laughs>
uh, psychiatric disorders and substance abuse disorders. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of time uh, to play in the studio. Um, so I did a lot of painting uh, and some ceramics. Uh, I made some bottles, I made some uh, masks, uh, which I've always done, and uh, did some stuff on the Potter's Wheel. Uh, eventually, uh, the paintings that I was doing started to be more about myself and my friends and relatives, and um, I started to close in uh, on that as subject matter. Um, and then suddenly, I was forced to close in on that as subject matter because, you know, the pandemic hit. Um, so when the pandemic hit, being my own model was really just the right thing. Um, so um, anyway, these bottles come out of that. I, I started by painting at the beginning of the pandemic. And then I started working some of those images onto slabs of clay, um, just because I like to work in the clay and like to draw on the clay. And eventually my brain said, well, let's try to throw it on a bottle. So I threw my image onto a bottle and then another one, another one, and I guess I'm a little obsessive uh, and got a lot of my images on bottles. But in between, I also made images of other people and other things. Um, I guess I really started with a lot of flowers and animals. Um, this one up front uh, is one of the earlier ones. Um, it is a tribute to my cousin Patricia Page and my other cousin Amasi. It's called Two Poets. And uh, they were both poets and they died. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I made these two bottles to go as a set, um, as a tribute to them. The one to the left came a bit later. It's actually a self-portrait of me as a little kid. Um, it comes from a photograph that is about 50, 55 years old. I want to say 40, but that would be a lie. Um, but yes, about 55 years old when I was in elementary school. And you can even see the little OLS on the bottom of the tie, because uh, I went to a Catholic school, uh, I'll leave you of sorrows. Um, in the first paint, in the uh, first bottles, you can see that I started using um, stains for coloration. But in the second bottle, I only used the uh, color itself, color from the clay itself, because I was you know, mixing clay bodies I had all that excess clay sitting around the studio. So um, I thought that it looked very skin-like, um, so I just drew a, a little figure of myself on it. Later on, I went back to using more of the pigments, um, mason stains mostly, and painted this third bottle. And I'm saying painted, it's, it's really very little light painting. Um, I start by drawing with um, uh, copper, no, no, cobalt carbonate uh, mixed with water with a, with a, uh, ja a Japanese type brush and draw linear drawings. Then I uh, fire them and glaze them and come back in and rework them and put color in and fire them again and glaze them again. And, you know, so it's a, it's a process and it takes a while because I'm trying to build up layers. Um, that's not as evident in these three bottles as it will be, hopefully, if you ever see any of my current work. Because now, after jumping from the bottle, I'm back to just working on slabs. Not that I'm rejecting the bottle. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, the bottle is very, I, I guess they probably are sensitive sometimes. You know, when I started building really big ones, not that this big, um, they really started to take on like a kind of humanistic form and they would dance with each other and uh, started sort of looking like buildings and uh, when I put them all together on a table they would be like a landscape. So, you know, they were, they were speaking to me all the time um, and that was before I put any of the images on them. They were just, you know, highly colored or uh, dully colored glazed bottles. 
Um, and I still work in the same way. There's still glaze on the inside, so you can still use them. But I'm, I'm, I don't know if I, how I feel about people using my face to drink things out of. Um, but I guess it's okay. Um, anyway, um, what else? The images that I'm doing now on slabs are very similar to this back one, which is um, uh, self-portrait with hat, uh, naturally. And um, they're similar in that the focus really is on the, the face and on coloration, on uh, skin tone. Um, my skin in different light uh, appears to be different colors, so I capitalize that by using, capitalize on it by using different pigments uh, at different times. And that's what I do. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Yeah, thanks, George. You're welcome. I have, how many of these bottles have you made? You um, well, if we go back to just the glazed bottles, um, we could go into over 100. Um, uh -huh. These bottles with pictures on them, it's approaching 100. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and then I have, you know, the new work, which, which is a slabs, and that I'm already beginning to be obsessive with. I probably have 20, 30 of those. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I just, you know, once it, I start a, a process, I want to, you know, keep on working on it and work out the, the kinks and keep on doing it until I get it right. And I know you said in, you don't you don't tend to use any of these bottles, but did you initially the initial ones that you started making those were for those those were for, for use. yeah I, I used the bottles that we made initially either yeah. for sake or um, whiskey water sometimes to go with the whiskey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, not that I'm a really big drinker, but you know it, it made sense to have those kind of bottles. Yeah. And yeah, now I don't tend to use them. Um, but I know that some of them that are, I've seen a few that are left behind in Asia, and you know, they're like fla little flowers and dried flowers mm -hmm. in them. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Really neat. yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's, I mean, oh, anyone else who wants, please chime in. But the, I don't know, the way that you, often pair them or they come as yeah and for example that this set or even if they're you know three separate works like it is here mm -hmm. they do sort of talk to it they have their own personalities just like right I don't well, know, yeah like if you're filling them with drinks they have you know, different drinks have different personalities too and it's sort of that's kind of wonderful yeah what's what's funny is that they have their own personalities from the back and the side too mm -hmm. but then when you add the image onto them yeah, I, I like to think of them as having conversations with each other, um, which is one of the reasons I probably do so many of them. Yeah. Um, and of course, my house and my studio is cluttered with me, um, <laughs> which sometimes disturbs my wife. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's just the way it is. Disturbed is a little strong. Oh, disturbed is a little strong. <laughs> See, she questions, you know, why wow. is your image over I do sometimes, place? I just say, like, there's George and there's George and there's George. And there's George. Like, Staring. I'm surrounded by George. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> yes. Do you have to fire these? Do you, do you make the bottle first and then, you know, cook it and put, you know, finishes on them and then do the drawing? Is that what you do? Um, okay, the pieces, the bottles are made out of slabs. When the slabs are in their leather hard state, is when I'll do the initial drawing on them um, and fire them to bisque. Uh, then I'll come in and, and put clear glaze on top of the drawing and then I'll start adding pigments, uh, mason stains to, to make color and fire them again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes I'll fire them two or three times, mm -hmm. which is why um, right now it's more convenient to work on slabs than to work on bottles because bottles don't like so much activity. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff in the kiln sort of does that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when bottles do that, they tend to separate, so. Mm -hmm. Yes? How do you glaze the inside of the bottle? Oh, that's easy, I just pour the glaze in. Oh, and then? Pour it in, 
Swish it around, pour it upside down, pour it up. That's, that's the best part of the process. <laughs> I don't have to think at all, but yeah, and then I take a bucket and dip the piece in, you know, unless it's really big, in which case I'll you know, bust the, the blades on. Oh, okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. So you made really, you said you were making really large versions well, of I, these with portraits? I, I got to about this, this tall with wow. a couple of portraits, um, you know, and that's why I know that the slabs survive better than the bottles. Mm. Because in a larger size, there's you know there's a lot more drama, more in the hair, yeah. and, you know, a lot more errors that can occur. So, yes. So, do you work every day, or do you go in spurts like Michelle? <laughs> um, I go in spurts, but not like Michelle. I go in spurts because um, on Wednesdays I have to teach way up there in Bergen County. On Fridays I have to teach back up there again. So those days, you know, I'm completely wiped out by the time I get home. Maybe I'll get to my studio, maybe not. The other days of the week, I tend to go to my studio and work. Um, but I do have students in my studio, too. So sometimes, you know, I'm working with the students that are doing my own work. Opportunity to study a little bit with Toshiko before she died, you know, just just a workshop. Um, and and Lugo, I haven't met yet, but you know, maybe that will come up. I've seen the show, of course, and seen him in all the magazines. Love you, please, else. Um, so um, yeah, totems, totemic. Um, they feel like cityscapes to me, like like. Um, um, if you, were to, if you were able to take the graffiti on the side of buildings and make it large enough so that it encompassed the whole building and make it important or, or visually um, uh, realistic or, or relevant enough so that people would want to look at it, then that's what it feels like to me. Right. I can see that. Yes. 
Thanks. <clears throat> Just to piggyback on you saying CV speed, because that's, that's sort of like what I see when I look at that, at, mm -hmm. at the assemblage of this piece. It looks, it looks they, look, they look like murals on the side of buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, so if, if I didn't actually, if I wasn't here in person and didn't see the scale, it could easily convince me that that's a skyscraper. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have a hundred of these things, right? A hundred of the, these bottles, right? Um, are you starting to like, sort of like wash them together and make other things out of them? Like cityscapes or like, uh, I don't know. No, I'm finished with that. <laughs> Uh, yes, my, my studio does look like that. I have a cityscape over here, then I have a, a, another cityscape with all of the imagery on them, and up there on the top shelf I have a bunch of other buildings. And Yeah, so, I mean, I sometimes think of them as bottles, sometimes think of them as buildings, but they're all over the place. Um, and I'm cutting back, uh, not on making them, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to make more of them. But I'm cutting back on displaying them, you know, in my studio because I'm just shoving them as far back on the shelf as I can get them, so I have space to make new ones. Yes. So I'm. I love the idea of combining drawing and sculpture. That's something that's always been for me. Like I love to draw, and I'm curious where you're going, or where you from this point on with the drawing. Like how important is drawing to you on them, and how are they integrated? How is the drawing integrated? Yeah, I would say that um, the new tiles that I'm making rely heavily on drawing. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are influenced, as I said, be, by the bottle of myself in the hat, um, in that the focus is really on the face. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, I know Michelle talked about not working from photographs. Uh, because I, I work on myself, I almost exclusively work with the photographs now. Mm -hmm. I used to work in front of a mirror, but it's hard to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I take photographs in, in different poses, but it's like, it's like the camera is with my audience. So, we go back to that whole concept of, you know, who's the audience and who's the primary audience, and I know that. You know, if I don't satisfy myself, then I'm not going to satisfy anybody else either, or, or I assume so. Um, and I don't want to. You know, um, I'm the artist while I'm making it, but I'm the viewer, I'm the observer as soon as I stop making it. Maybe we can take one more question from the audience. Um, yes. Oh, I'm just going to make a comment. The Two pieces in the front uh -huh. remind me of uh, Adobe's yeah. Thank structures. You. Thank you. I, you know what? Initially, when I started working with slabs, I was building buildings and building little huts, and you know, I was teaching uh, at Ravenna Valley and had a whole bunch of, of uh, students make huts out of slabs of clay and um, castles out of slabs of clay. So yeah, I I, I like that. Um, uh, melting quality that, that the material has. Yeah, and even the color. Yes, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all have been a terrific interactive audience. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, George. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, it's been a real privilege to have you here in our galleries and talk about your, your work, so thank you. Um, our next talk is February 22nd, same time, same place, so we hope to, to see you there if you're able to make it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.